Well, what a wonderful, wonderful day it is. And I'm grateful to have my grandson here, Landon. And he's laying down in the pew right now, but he is there. But he, had, evidently, he had given his father uh, the greatest dad award that, for being the greatest dad, and he is wearing it today. Amen? What a blessing that is. I believe that that is wonderful for dad to show off what his children give them. Amen? And Brother Jeff over here, he has a, a tie with all his kids on it. I'm sure that they gave it to him to be the ugliest tie that there is, but not in the, <laughs> no, just kidding. But, but, it, but they are wearing, he is wearing it with pride, amen? What a tremendous day it is to be able to celebrate fathers. And uh, the lesson of the day is going to come from the book of Proverbs. You can go ahead and turn your Bible there. And we're going to be looking through several passages in Proverbs, I and mean, we're not to have one uh, specific proverb, but we're going to be looking at lessons for fathers, lessons for fathers. Being a father has always been a high priority of mine, because when I was growing up, I had no father. I always wanted my kids to have, some, to have that. And can I tell you the truth? I'm going to be honest with you. It's by the grace of God that that took place. I was not always, I, I was not always in church, and I, I didn't always believe in God, and I didn't always serve God. And I was a wicked, wicked man. And uh, my children were born, I, Brother Jeff said uh, that, that um, uh, Bethany is going to be 21. I was 21 years old when I was married. And uh, boy, I want to tell you something. I didn't understand it then, but uh, everybody that come by and shook my hand said, good luck, you're going to need it. And the truth was that I did need, I mean, I didn't need luck, I needed God. But uh, the thing was, I didn't realize what all was in marriage. I didn't realize what all was in being a, a father. But the very next year, I became a father to a young man who now I am very proud of, and all my children really that I'm proud of, all of them trying to serve the Lord, seeking the Lord, and I'm grateful for that. But it's always been a high priority of mine to be a father. And even though that I've not, not always been the greatest father, in many places I have failed miserably. And the good thing is that nobody but my children and me and my wife know these miserable places, amen. But I'm so grateful that the Word of God has given us so much to be able to, to learn about being a father. And even though we may fail and even though it may, we may not succeed in the places that we need to, there's a great demand, a great demand for fathers. And unfortunately, this high uh, priority role by which fathers have is systematically being attacked and destroyed through our culture. It is being, it is being, and has been for for decades, Amen. being battled and and uh, brought down to a place where where it's not uh, highly sought after. Are highly esteemed. This particular society in which we live attacks the male role and has devastated it to the place that uh, I believe we have sentenced the next three or four generations to great catastrophe. I really believe that. And because it's one of the most clear things in scripture that is given that the sins of the father is visited unto the third and fourth generation and what it means is is that wicked men leaders when they are declined are declined the role of the father it takes three or four generations to root out that evilness that has been produced and that is 
very sad because we have definitely in our culture today a wicked, wicked, wicked leadership in fatherhood. And it's sad. But before we go much farther, I I want to start off with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, once again, I do come before you, Lord, asking that you'll help us as we look into this great, great role that you've set before us in this world as men to, to govern and to lead and to direct and to guide our children and our household, Lord. And God, I pray that you, would, that you would stir our hearts today. God, that you'd open our eyes. Lord, that you'd even bring us to a place of repentance, Lord, because for sure we are men that need to repent before you of the job that we have done in this society. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see your great grace and goodness. And Lord, the instruction by which you've given us. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you accomplish. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we are looking at this role of fatherhood. And and because of the fact that the leaders of our nations and the leaders that are around us are men that by which have been given the the impact of of leading a godly nation or to lead him right just to be uh, one of integrity and and uprightness has failed. Uh, There is a root of wickedness by which uh, our children shall inherit. And the generation to come Fathers have allowed this to flow to the next generation. In the plan of God, however, there's not, that is not the way it should be, and especially in the church. The church should always follow the, the plan of God, and it should always, and it should always uh, have a, a, uh, a surrounding of, of trying to bring forth godly inheritance for the next generation. No matter what happens in the society around it. No matter what is going on, the church should to genuinely have that goal to have right standards. To uplift right fathers for the next generation to have examples. We have a responsibility as fathers to our, our children, but specifically to our sons. And I want to understand, or I want you to understand, that there's a authority by which God is ordained. And that authority by which God is ordained is, is God, man, women, and children. And that is the that is the that is the, the 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 way God has set it up. It's not the way that David Bentley set it up. It's not the way the church set it up. It's not the way society definitely hasn't set it up that way. But God has set it up that way. And because of that, it is it is a great responsibility for us men to stand up in the role that God has given us. And not only that, but to teach our sons, our daughters also, but our sons to stand in that same role for God. We have a great responsibility as fathers. If we will faithfully teach our sons and they will be the examples, uh, uh, by example and, and precept, they'll lead the women as well in the same. And they will be a a greater number or a plurality of in our nation of godly fathers. They will impact the mothers and the mothers will will impact godly sons and the impact of the daughters of the next generation. 
And so the high priority of Scripture is given to fathers to teach their sons and daughters to raise up a generation of godly leaders. Now because God has ordained this, and because God wants us to uh, wants us to, to surely follow how to carefully do this. God, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, has given a manual to fathers to use on their children, but especially to their sons, of the basic resource book, you could say. And this book is the book of Proverbs. And I want to invite you, as I already have, to... Turn to the book of Proverbs, and, and uh, we're, I want to be able to give you ten things. I really do. But time only permits me to give you two, and I'm actually going to redeem some of the time that I've let you all have back. Amen? So I hope that you will one day listen to it. I'm, I am going to put them all ten on, uh, uh, on uh, tape to be able to have but uh, I, I want to be able to really dig into these two. Now, this book of lessons uh, book that we have is, is for fathers and their teaching their sons. In fact, it, what it is is very apparent. In the first chapter, or verse number 8, it says, my son, hear the instruction of, my, uh, of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. You find it again in Proverbs chapter number 2. My son, if thou will receive my word and hide my commandments in, with thee. In Proverbs chapter number 3 and verse number 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Proverbs chapter number 4 and verse number 1, it says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend unto knowledge, uh, and to, un, attend unto to know understanding. Proverbs chapter number 5 and verse number 1, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and by thy ear unto my understanding. Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 20, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother proverbs chapter number seven in verse number one my son keep my word and lay up my commandments with thee and so it goes that this this is a definite book for fathers to teach your sons to teach their sons and as they teach their sons so go the nation can I tell you, we are giving out the principles of God, the basic principles of spiritual living is packed in these 31 chapters of Proverbs. Now, a proverb is a very simple thing. It is a principle uh, stated in concise uh, 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 terms. We could say a proverb is wisdom and content and, and in form. It is a brief, to the point, consistent statement for the purpose of instruction. Brief, to the point. What you have in a proverb then is the collection of concise wise statements this then becomes the basic book of truth that fathers use to teach their children wisdom now much of today's instruction uh, that is for fathers is to be a friend to listen to your sons to go places with them take them to baseball games have fun with them follow them and and do things with them that are, are interesting. That is the basic instructions of fathers of today. Can I tell you, those things aren't bad. And I, I, I'm not up here to say that you should not do those things. 
I believe that they are, they are given that, that we should spend time with our children. I mean, not just, not just uh, be in the same room. Not just uh, be in the same car. Not just be in the same location. But spend time with our children. But I do want to say this right here. The Proverbs are given that, that we may have a much deeper relationship than just that. A much deeper relationship than just travailing, uh, tra- travailous things such as baseball games and, and practices and, and, uh, and, and, and fishing and hunting and, and things like that or, or things that they may enjoy. But that we may teach them deep things of God. That we may be fathers that become teachers of deeper things than carnal. So the primary duty of a father is not what one boy said. The primary duty of his dad was to take out the trash. Can I tell you, the the primary duty of the dad is not to take out the trash in the house. And it's not to bring home the bacon either. It's not, can I tell you, as fathers, your primary duty is not to provide the money for the family. That is not it. It is not even, and Rebecca said the other day, she said, I thought my dad could fix anything. It's not to fix the things that are broke around the house. That, those, are, those are great duties to have and things we are to uphold, but those are not the primary things of our lives as men. The primary duty of a father is to teach holy living to his sons and daughters, a holy lifestyle. Now, in the process of teaching, there is one compelling, overarching lesson that is that we're to teach them wisdom. We're to teach them wisdom. The word which dominates the Proverbs is the word wisdom. Sometimes it's the word instruction appears. Sometimes the word understanding appears. Sometimes the word discernment or discretion appears. But all of these are elements of wisdom. Every one of them are are elements of wisdom. To know, to understand, to instruct, to have discernment means to act in wisdom. Wisdom means not simply uh, thought, but conduct. It's very easy for us to, to have an... An act of wisdom as far as the, uh, the voice and the words that come out of our mouth. But the conduct of wisdom comes from basic living of truths of the word of God. We are to teach our sons spiritual wisdom. It is the noblest, greatest, purest pursuit of their life. In chapter number 1. In verse number 20, wisdom is shouting in the street. Wisdom is personified here. Wisdom is, is lifting up her voice in the, in the square. She is crying in verse number 22. For people to turn from, from, from being uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh to turn from uh, their not understanding as, as, uh, from being scoffers of, of foolishness and to turn to wisdom. Naive is the word I was looking for. I knew it would come to me. Amen. It just takes me a little while. I'm slower than most, okay? But I get there. The call of, of the book of Proverbs is the call to wisdom. The call to wisdom. In fact, in chapter number 2, if you would please note, the call of wisdom comes at a time in chapter number 1 
as wisdom is personified and crying out for men to come to her. In chapter number 2, then we find the father encouraging the son to seek wisdom. In chapter number 2 and verse number 4, it says, If thou seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure. In chapter And verse number 5 says, Then shall thou, thou understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. Verse number 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. The Father is saying, pursue wisdom, pursue wisdom, pursue wisdom. That is the overarching lesson that fathers must teach their sons and daughters. The pursuit of wisdom. In chapter number 10 and verse number 1, it says, A wise son will make a glad father, or make a father glad. But a foolish son will bring be grief unto his mother or bring shame. Now, we are then fathers responsible on Father's Day to rethink the priority of teaching our son's wisdom. And I would like for us to look at the lessons of a faithful father and what he must teach their children. If you want your son to be blessed and to be a blessing to you and be a blessing to the culture by which we live, in Proverbs, there are ten lessons by which we must teach them. Like I said, unfortunately, we're only going to cover two this morning. But the sum of them is spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. And the very first spiritual wisdom that we must impart to our children as fathers is that we must teach them to fear your God. In chapter number 1 and verse number 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In chapter number 9 and verse number 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Everything starts with the fear of God. What do you mean fear? Well, it has to do with a positive response of reverence, respect, a reverential awe, if you would. That means that I have to teach my son about God. I have to teach my son about uh, what God is like. I have to teach him the attributes of God. I have to teach him the power of God. I have to teach him the holiness of God, the omnipotence of God, the, the omnipotence of God. I need to teach my son the immutability of God, that he's not going to change, that he is a just God, that he's merciful, that he's kind, that he's loving, that he's gracious, that he's merciful, and that he's sovereign. This, these, are, these are lessons that, in fearing God that we must bring out and let our children know who God is. Can I tell you today, we're, we are experiencing a, a, a reviving of a, of a group of, of, of people who are seeking a God in an unreverenced way. Yes. Can I tell you, God isn't acceptable of that. I don't care how much it looks like it's getting done. I don't care what kind of revival it looks like it's taking place. I'm telling you right now that God is not in that. You say, well, how can that be, Brother David? Because it's not the way God is. It's not the character of God. God's unchangeable. His way of worship hasn't changed. His way of acceptance hasn't changed. 
I want you to know today, today, if David was bringing the ark of God back and someone put their hand up when it was rocking and destabilizing, God wouldn't say, well, bless God, he sure was trying, really kind. No, God would smote him dead just like he did back then. God's not changing. The problem is we as fathers have failed to teach our children the reverence and greatness of God. We have failed to pass that on. Then on the other side of that, we must teach our sons to fear the displeasure of God. The fear right. That God has the right to punish. We don't never want to hear that part of God. That that God is right in punishing people. God is right in sending people to hell. God is right in in allowing us to go through chastising. He is right in judging our lives. There's... has to be an awe and reverence of God's holiness. His holy character. There has to be a healthy sense and appreciation because God is known as holy. And he has the right to punish sin. Not only your sin, but my sin. We must teach our children that he has that right. If we want to do our sons a great favor and our daughters a great favor, we as fathers must endeavor to teach them the character of God. Can I tell you I, I ordered a book this week, a book I've, I have never heard of until I was in my study for fathers, but I want to give it to you. It is leading little ones to know the character of God. It teaches the attributes of God. It, it teaches the positions of, of God, how, 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 what, what God is like. They must know who their God is. They must learn how to worship their God rightly. That is a part of fearing Him. Teach your sons to worship. And you teach not only by what you say, but you teach by what you do. The question comes down to, do you worship the Lord? Are you consistent and faithful in worshiping the Lord at the house of God? Are you there in the, in the, in the morning when the doors open and in the evening when the doors close? And are, you at, are you the same at home as you are at church? We must be consistent in our teaching. We cannot be one thing in one place and one thing in another and expect our children to come out right. I read something on Facebook this morning I thought was really appropriate. It said if, if church is an option to you, it, w- it, will not be, um, it, it, it will not be necessary for your children. We must make God a priority in our life. That not only is He a priority in our life, but a a priority that we share with our children. Do your children look at you as a true worshiper? Because whatever pattern of worship you have established in in your own life. Now I want you to get this. Because for many years I never understood this. And until just recently in my 60s did I come to grips with this. My children need to see me do devotions. They need to see me pray. 
not necessarily with them, but maybe about them. They need to see me in personal worship with God. That makes the difference. What about our living? Is it healthy, fearful holiness of right pursuit before God? Do you have that healthy fear? Do you understand that God has the right to punish you? Even as His children? Do you... So live a, 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 to avoid that in your life. That means that sin is so, so away from you, you. You desire to keep it so far away from you that, that you're not. That you do what the Bible says that you flee from it. Notice what Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5 says. In description of the worship heart it says. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. I want to teach my son to trust the Lord. You say, well, the only one you have in the house is Daniel. No, I'm still teaching. They're looking from afar. Fatherhood never stops. Never. If all your sons die and you have grandsons and grandchildren, can I tell you, you're still teaching. I want to teach my sons to trust the Lord with all their heart, all his heart, all that they have. The word in the Hebrew originally means to To lie helplessly face down. There's a sense of humility there. But there's also a sense of submission. There in that total sovereign control of God. In which we worship saying. I'm not only here humbling myself before you in thy presence, but I'm bowing in presence of you in submission of anything you choose to do with me. That's what it means when it says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. In which the worshiper says, That's how much I trust you, Lord. I trust you no matter what's going on around me that you are in control. That you have the situation under control. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. The Hebrew word doesn't mean to incline. It means to support yourself. Teach him not to support himself by his own wisdom but to support himself by God's wisdom. In all your ways, acknowledge him. It's not just going to church. It's not just, it's not just coming, coming around people that, that believe the same as you. But in every way that you live your life, in every aspect, in every avenue of your life, Show him how to lay down before God in total submission and trust him. That's what it says. Can I tell you today, we need a a generation that is can see fathers trusting God. We need that. We stand in a time of great need. In all my life, I have never seen America so messed up. So ununited. 
Now, I want to tell you something. We're in, we're in big trouble. And the truth is, there, there's nobody that knows what to do about it. Yeah, God's the only one. God's the only one. But can I tell you what we need most of all is we need fathers to stand up and be what God has called them to be. And to lead their children. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I lied to you. And you can count it, you can write it down that I'm your pastor is a liar. I was only able to get one point in instead of two. Listen, there's there's such a great need for fathers today. Men who will stand and not be dictated by the world and by, by situations around them. And stand in the word of God for their children. And to teach them. Can I tell you, I want to say this. Our pursuit of comfort has been on the sacrifice of the family. And today we're reaping the consequences of it. My question to you today is, are you a godly father? Not that you just know God. Are you a godly father that you're revealing God in every avenue of your life? Have you surrendered yourself to him and to teach those principles to your children? Because I'm telling you, you want to change our nation? You must change our children. And where it takes place, can I tell you? It's going to be at the altar of God. It's time to put away the pride. It's time to time to put away the blame, the excuses. It's time for us to get before God and to repent and ask God's forgiveness and pursue. To teach our children the lessons of God. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Oh, God, there's so much in your word that we as fathers need to know and need to heed and need to to preach and teach our children. God, I pray that you would search our hearts. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, for, for how inconsistent I was as a father. And help me, Lord, to be more consistent for my children today and my grandchildren of the next generation to teach them the principles, to stand true to thy word, to reveal the truth in the word of God That they may have and be a godly generation that would magnify and change the things to come. And Lord, I love you and thank you for all that you do. Bless, I pray. Have your will in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll shake hands with one another. You're dismissed. Amen. Amen.